Okay class, this is my first time um, doing one of these videos and publishing it to YouTube, but I wanted to give you your notes and I wanted to do it in a in a way where the, for those of you who are gone, you can easily access them. And obviously, those of you who are watching it in class right now, I'm the one who's gone. And so this really makes it easy for um, those who have been gone and for me to get this done. So we're going to talk about your intro to sociology and cultural diversity notes today. Um, at any point in this video, if you need to take down notes and I've gone too quickly, please press the pause button. Right, and sorry about some of these animations here. What do you need to keep in mind though when you are studying so, um, social and cultural variation or studying society? Well, the first thing you need to keep in mind is the sociological perspective. That is a systematic or scientific way to view aspects of society as opposed to merely using common sense. Oftentimes, it's human nature just to try to find a simple answer for something. And even in conversation, you will hear people saying, well, it's the way he was raised, or that it's just genetics, that's the way the person was born. You have to kind of look just beyond that common sense and like look at the science behind um, what's going on in society. The next one is sociological imagination. That is the ability to connect our personal lives to the larger world. Um, oftentimes we don't think about how what happens in our own lives affects the world in general, but there is definitely a connection. Cultural relativism. Um, that's the idea that cultures should not be compared to each other, but judged by their own standards. And sometimes we um, when we are looking at different cultures, we think that the behaviors or the different, um, I don't know, traditions or other things like that that another culture does is weird. It's not normal, but it really is normal. It just isn't normal compared to our standards. So each culture must be judged by its own standards. Oops, sorry. And then ethnocentrism. That is seeing one's own cultural group as superior to others. And that is something that sociologists and those studying sociology have to avoid. It works back, uh, goes back actually to cultural relativism. And so it's really hard to critically judge a culture by its own standards if you're looking at your culture as being superior to others. So I have some pictures here just for the heck of it. All right, so here's a picture of um, me, actually, uh, that I photoshopped into a website called yourbookyourself.com. And if a person were to just look at the picture without paying attention to the website or that it had been photoshopped, they might automatically assume, just using common sense, that this was a yearbook picture from the 1960s. It is not, though. Like I said, it's a photoshopped picture of me um, when I was in college. And so it's one of those things where you have to look scientifically, investigate a little more. Don't just use common sense. All right, Billy Ray Cyrus is our example of, of cultural relativism. Okay, cultural relativism is the idea that culture should not be judged by another culture standards. So here we are living in 2015. We have a different kind of culture here in the Midwest than the South did in the early 1990s. And so he um, represents country music culture of the 1990s here, and he has a mullet. Now, we typically would think that that's not a normal hairdo that we see this day and age among those in our Midwestern cultural group, but for that time period, that was a typical haircut, and it was a typical haircut within that culture. So cultural relativism is not just um, the culture itself, but the time period as well. Okay, this is my example of sociological imagination. This is an old picture as well. Um, this is a picture of me with my niece, and her graduation from high school did more than impact her personally. It had an impact with, on a larger world. Um, she became a taxpayer, a person in the national workforce, and so with this event, we see something that affects society, not just her. Okay, 
These are the current theoretical perspectives. If it's underlined, write it, write it down. Write the functionalist perspective. That is broadly based on the ideas of people like Comte, Spencer, and Durkheim. That is the view that society is a set of interrelated parts that work together to produce a stable social system. Basically, each um, component of a society has a function, it has a purpose. And when those things function properly, then you have a stable social system. So this is a way of analyzing society from a position where you're looking, how does this function and how does this other part of society function? So when we're talking about functions, there are two kinds of functions. We have the manifest function, which is the intended and recognized consequence of some element of society. And we have the latent function. The latent function is the unintended and unrecognized consequence of some element of society. And so we're usually talking about bigger things than the example I'm going to use now. But for every um, interrelated part of society, there is an intended consequence, but there are some unintended things that happen as well. My example is kind of a silly one, but here's another picture of me from when I was in college. And yes, people took selfies back then too, but we didn't call them that. I don't know what we called it, but I had a little digital camera I took this picture with. But anyway, I'm wearing sunglasses. So if we look at the manifest function of sunglasses, or the intended and recognized consequence, that would be keeping the sun and UV rays out of a person's eyes. So the unintended and unrecognized consequence that people are starting to notice is that these are a pair of sweet shades. I know I said that quite funny. But the idea here, once again, is that you have something and it has a purpose, it has a function, but there are some things that go along with it that maybe are not initially intended with. Let's continue on to the next slide. The conflict perspective. The idea with this is um, based on things that Karl Marx came up with in his theory of Marxism. Um, Marxism was the basis for things like economic and political ideologies, communism, socialism, so on. Um, but basically, the focus is on forces in society that promote competition and change. It's about the conflict among groups that lead to change. Another way to look at it, according to Marx, um, there are different social groups. And so this change occurs due to conflict and competition among those groups in society. He directly related this conflict among socioeconomic classes, and he said that the regular working class people or the proletariat would one day overthrow the um, people who had the money, the people who had the means for production, or the bourgeoisie. And I found this piece of clip art and it's not in motion like it was before. I don't know what happened. I think maybe because I'm taking a video of it, it's not working properly. But I'll get my cursor out here. You see that there is the guy on top. He's the one making the money. And he has all these people below him working. At some point, according to Marx, the power was shifted to these people down here from this guy up here. And there is Karl Marx himself. All right. And then our last current theoretical perspective is the interactionist perspective. That focuses on how individuals interact with each other in society. And how do people interact with each other? They use symbols. A symbol is anything that represents something else. It is used when people interact. That's why we call it symbolic interaction in your textbook and in the class. What we have going on here is the idea that a hand gesture, a nod of the head, any word coming out of a person's mouth symbolizes some object, some piece of society, some idea. Um, it's really, it's interesting to think about, about it, but it's, the words that come out of our mouths aren't those objects themselves, they're just a description of those objects or those ideas or components of society. And so this really looks at how do people use those symbols to get their thoughts across, to get their point across to other people. Right here we have um, a crowd watching an outdoor play. And we see a lot of different things going on here. Um, you can tell by 
the smiles on people's faces, that's a symbol of them thinking that something is funny, that they're laughing. Um, it's symbolic of that humor, their sense of humor. Um, it's symbolic of what's going on in front of them. They think, like I said, something's funny. Um, there are a couple people who look like they're about to clap, and that's symbolic of them enjoying what's going on. Um, the person who's taking the picture, the young man up front taking the picture, that's a symbol of thinking that what's going on is pretty neat, so he wanted to take a photograph of it. So there are a lot of things, a lot of ways people interact with each other in a society. Oh, peace sign. If that had been World War II, though, uh, um, at the end of World War II in 1945 in Europe, people would think that was a victory sign. Okay, what is culture and its components? Culture would be all the shared physical or the material culture and abstract or non-material culture products of human groups. So the shared physical and abstract products of human groups. There are five components of culture. I'm going to skip the clip art on this one. But the five components of culture are technology, symbols, language, values, and norms. Technology is different in different cultures and in different time periods. Now we look at like digital, computer, phone technologies, and we think of that as being our technology. Um, symbols, that would be like a peace sign, a smiley face, anything like that um, that symbolizes thoughts, feelings, um, different abstract or product ideas. Let's see. And then we have language, which is the spoken word, written word, things like that. Values, what we think is right, wrong, that's morals in particular, but mores is another word for it. Um, just what do we think is important in our culture? And then norms. And that is pretty much anything that is just considered normal or abnormal. Next thing we have is um, the ideas of what do we do when we examine culture. Culture is not static, but dynamic, meaning it doesn't stay the same, it continually changes. And we have three levels of culture. The simple level would be the culture traits, the middle are culture complexes, and the largest would be culture patterns. And I made a diagram that is similar to something that you'll see on page 27 of your textbook. I would refer to that so that you have more details of what these different um, levels of culture are. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so we've had in the past different um, people, sociologists, anthropologists, other types of behavioral scientists who are studying commonality and variation in culture. The first person is Murdoch. He discovered 65 cultural universals in the 1940s. So that would be 65 things that are the, are the same no matter what culture you are in. So all cultures have a marriage ceremony. All cultures have some concept of the term family. All cultures have a funeral ceremony and so on. Margaret Mead, on the other hand, was looking to find variation. So she studied and noticed variation between two particular groups and one anthropological case study. Um, these groups were the Arapesh and the Mundagumer. Among these groups, she realized that they were very different. You had one group that was very good humored and humored, excuse me, and one that seemed kind of not happy most of the time. And she looked at different factors for why they were different in these ways. Um, the geography of the region made a difference. Temperament that came really from biology, it seemed like, made a difference. And, you know, the way people were raised in these different cultures also made a difference. So there are many things that factor into why cultures are not the same. Cultures can vary within society as well. And when you have this variation, you have groups that are called subcultures and countercultures. People who belong to an indie type culture are actually part of a subculture, whereas the people who we call hippies from the 1960s were part of a counterculture. They even called it the counterculture movement. All right. I'm almost out of time, so... Oh, this is what I want you to see. Here's your assignments. I should not say to submit to Canvas discussion, so I'll leave that off there. So there is an explanation of this on Canvas. 
for chapter one summaries. So summarize your work.